Oh, we have someone uh, all the way from Naples, Florida here today. Welcome, Jennifer. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on Zoom. My name is Megan, and it is Weldon, Megan Weldon. It is my honor and pleasure to be the Executive Director of OLLI, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College. We're a member, membership-based program that provides educational, social, and volunteer opportunities designed especially by and for people 50 years and better. But everyone of any age can participate in OLLI. As I mentioned before, we, um, we do have your microphones and uh, cameras off, but we strongly encourage comments and questions throughout the presentation. You can submit them in the chat box. And right now people are saying hello in the chat box and where they're from. We have someone from uh, Long Beach, New York, Naples, Florida, Fort Lee, New Jersey, and Rattlesnake Mountain, which would be right here in the Berkshires, mm. I believe. So uh, I'd like to mention very quickly two upcoming all events before we move on. First, this Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern, we have a fascinating discussion with author Larry Burns on the future of driverless or autonomous cars. And that talk is free and open to all and um, should be really fascinating. Um, Andy, can you put the link for that in the chat? And uh, second, uh, beginning Monday, September 21st, uh, we launch our fall semester of really terrific online classes on everything from poetry to constitutional law, the pilgrims, the middle ages, dinosaurs, and much more. Our classes have no tests, no grades, and no prerequisites. They are all just about learning for the love of learning. Speaking of the love of learning, that certainly describes Hope Hagler, the co-chair of the Distinguished Speakers Committee. Hope is a retired lawyer and a, a profound lover of classical music and many other things I'm sure but I definitely know the classical music and of course speakers and learning and she divides her time between Berkshires the Berkshires in Florida it's thanks to Hope and other OLLI volunteers that we have such extraordinary programs here at BCC please join me in welcoming Hope who will introduce today's speakers Hope thanks Megan Doctors Joan and Paul Gluck have enjoyed a life together celebrating a mutual passion for discovery and creativity in both science and the arts. Joan, a classically trained pianist, was encouraged to attend the Juilliard School, but her goal was always to pursue a career in medicine. She earned an undergraduate degree in anthropology before continuing on to medical school. Paul always enjoyed music and the visual arts, <clears throat> attending his first opera, Bizet's Carmen, at the age of 10. As an undergraduate, Paul's humanities concentration was in the arts. They met as students in medical school at NYU and were soon married. From their honeymoon on, they built up the collection you will learn about today. So let's begin. Thanks, Hope, and welcome to everyone. Uh, to give you a little more context about how we built this collection and how we started our interest, as Hope mentioned, we, were, we met in medical school and married during our third year. We were, had signed up for an elective, which is both research and study, at LA County Hospital, USC, and basically had a six to seven month, seven week honeymoon to go from Philadelphia to Los Angeles. Having grown up in Boston and Philadelphia, respectively, and having met in New York, we really wanted to see things outside of the big city. So we basically put dots in a map, connecting in national parks and Native American sites. And our honeymoon consisted of almost 7,000 miles in those six weeks, going from Philadelphia to Los Angeles, connecting the dots. And as we learned more and saw more of the native arts of the North America, and especially with Joan's background in anthropology, we fell in love with it. We fell in love with the aesthetic. Okay, how do I, my screen won't advance yet. Oh, there we go, okay. And, and so it was the aesthetic of the art that really drew us to it. But, but then as we started collecting more, we wanted to learn more about the use of the art ceremonially, and the system and the culture from which it came. And so that started a, a research that we've been doing over the years into this art form. 
The central premise of this culture and this art, and it's true in many other cultures, is that first the environment shapes a culture. And we'll see a bit about how that happened in the Northwest Post. And then from the culture came the art. So you can see echoes of the culture and the environment reflected in the art forms of this culture. So we're gonna talk about today, we'll talk about the culture, the Western contact, uh, the environment, as I mentioned, the village. Shamanism was an important part of that culture, so we'll spend a little time about that. Potlatch, relatively unique to the Northwest Coast, is a very important part of their culture, so we'll spend a bit of time on that. Stories and myths, and then finally, we'll talk about some highlights of our collection and some of the things that we experienced as collectors and, and students of this art form. So first, the environment. And just let me mention, uh, before we get too far into the lecture, that with very few exceptions, the pieces that, that we're gonna illustrate our lecture, whether in our collection or formerly in our collection and now reside in a number of museums, the sepia photographs that you'll see, most of them come from Edward Curtis, and we have his folio from the Northwest Post uh, uh, Indians, and you'll see a number of those during the course of this presentation. So first, if we go back 15,000 to 25,000 years ago, Asia and North America were connected by a land bridge, and it's felt that most of the First Nations of North America came to this continent and also into South America over that land bridge as they followed the migrating herds. And of course, they settled in all different parts of the country and then, and the continent, but then with the different environments in different parts, the culture looked very different. So if you look at the First Nations of the Northwest Coast, which we'll look at today, it's very different than the Seminoles of Florida or very different than the Aztecs of South America. So the strip of land we're talking about is right along the coast in, uh, from Southeast Alaska, British Columbia, and into Northwest continental United States. Uh, Kwakutl is a very prominent tribe, so just to show you where they are in the midst of these uh, nations. And let me just mention while I'm on this slide, the people of this, this culture like to refer themselves at, to as the First Nations. Not indigenous tribes, not indigenous nation, not Indians by any means, but they really prefer to be called First Nations. So this is the topography of the area in which they settled. And the specific area right along the coast, you can see is very fertile and green. It's warmed by the Japanese current, so it's a relatively temperate area. If you've ever cruised the inside passage from Washington State to Alaska, uh, the reason the boats do that, it's relatively protected from the, the, the winds and from the waves of the Pacific. So it's, it's relatively tranquil water for them to traverse. Lots of inlets in the area. And uh, you can see the, the, this is where the villages grew up along the inlets. And very fertile forests, dense forests. The principal trees in the forest were cedars that grow tall and straight. And the cedar tree was very important for building shelters, for canoes, and they even utilized the bark in their clothing. They also harvested many berries and roots from the forest as a source of food. And here is a picture of a woman. She has what's called a burden basket. She carried on her back so she could stoop over and pick up the roots and berries and put them on her back in this basket. She also was wearing a skirt made of cedar bark. So they would take the cedar bark, strip it off the tree, pound it to make it a little more flexible, and then weave it into clothing. So this is a picture of the burden basket, a close up. And you can see, even though it's utilitarian, it was decorated in this beautiful pattern. And the yellow and red material, material in the front, that's what went over her forehead. The animals in the forest, and there were many of them, uh, they would hunt. They didn't hunt bear, but they did kill bear occasionally and use the fur uh, for ceremonial purposes. But they did hunt deer and sheep and land otter. This is a picture, and this is actually even used today in some areas, of what's called the deadfall trap. And this is a technique that they use to kill small mammals. Number two in the illustration on the left is what's called the trigger stick. 
And so in, uh, or the trap stick. So four is where they would put the, the, the bait. It would be attached by a line or, and then when the animal picked up the bait, the stone would fall on the small mammal and kill him. But the Indians felt, the Indians, First Nation felt, that if they invoked animal spirits in their activities, it would improve their hunting, their fishing, or whatever. So this is actually the trap stick that was used by the First Nations. And you can see there's two of them there. Each one is adorned at the top end with a carving of a bird effigy. And then the one on the right has a salmon sitting on the bird's head. So that would be in the place of number two in the previous illustration, a trap stick. Uh, this, is, this material is from bone, from animal bone is what they use for this. The rivers were very important, not only for navigation, but they would hunt beaver and traded in the pelts. And we'll talk about that a bit later. But the most important source of food for these uh, in, uh, natives was the salmon. The salmon were returned every year to spawn in the usual rivers. And so this was a renewable source of food that came back every year. So this is uh, how they would, would hunt the salmon and fish the salmon. Uh, on the right two pictures are the actual spear that they used. You can see how ingenious it is. It's made of, uh, of um, these parts is actually wood attached by sinew. This is deer antler that's carved. These are very, very sharp points. But you can see if they push down on the fish, it could be impaled quite easily and trapped by these spears. And what they used was a technique of, uh, of weir, where the fish would be herded literally into these pens of, of twigs and, and branches that they wove together, and then they could spear them quite easily. The two pictures on the left are actually from the mid 20th century, and techniques like this are still used in some locales by these First Nation tribes. Here is the spear in the illustration. Here he is catching a salmon. The seashore was also important. Uh, women would go out and dig for clams at low tide. And they would also go to sea and catch the other primary food source, and that's the halibut. As you can see from the picture in the bottom, halibut, and you may know this from your own experience, could be quite large. And the technique they used to fish, the, the picture on the lower left is what's called the halibut hook, and I'll show you, I'll go through that in a little more detail in the next slide. The picture on the right side, under the actual photo of the fish, is a, a, a fish club. And what would happen is they, these fish could be quite large. Picture going out to sea in an open boat, maybe 16 to 20 feet long, and catching, catching these big fish, and if they were in the boat thrashing around, it could swamp the boat. So once the fish, fish was in the boat, they'd hit him over the head with a fish club and subdue him so he'd stop thrashing. So let's look a little more detail at that halibut hook. They all had the same basic structure. There were there are two arms. On the left one is a metal barb. On the right one is an image of an effigy. In this case, it's a sea otter. And, and the, this is, would, again, be invoked to help them in their fishing. They could regulate the size of the salmon they caught by the distance between the tip of this barb and the, the other arm, the effigy. So if, if, it was too, if the fish was too big, he couldn't impale himself and take the bait out of this uh, structure. When Westerners came and saw this technique of fishing, they thought it was ridiculous and thought it wouldn't work. And actually, this technique, fishing for halibut, did much, much better than Western fishing techniques. So while we're talking about otter, they did hunt sea otter and for the pelts. And here is a, a, somebody out hunting with his bow and arrow. Sea otter, you may know, is one of the most prized pelts because the density of the hair per square inch is more than any other animal. Uh, mink, uh, beaver, any other animal. It's very luxurious fur. So while we're talking about that, let's get a little bit into the Western contact. And basically, there were a number of stages of contact, and this holds true for many civilizations. So first with the explorers. Um, even though the Spanish explorer Juan Perez was the first to contact 
these na this First Nation tribes. It was uh, the, sec the third voyage of Captain James Cook that had the most detailed record. And so this was in 1778. Later on, whaling fleets came from New England and Russia primarily. And as you may know from the history of whaling, these ships would go around Cape Horn and they'd go up for voyages sometime lasted a year or two or more, they would have to resupply. So realizing that there were abundant food sources along the Northwest coast, they would put in and have contact with these various tribes. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's my land phone. Just hang up. Thank you. Okay. Anyways, and uh, have contact with these tribes and they would trade for food. And in return, they would get all kinds of artifacts. In Salem, Massachusetts, one of the large fishing uh, whaling ports, uh, they would come back. And one of our favorite museums, and hopefully you've been there, and if not, I would highly recommend it in the future, is the Peabody Esk Museum. That museum started by the fishing captains, the whaling captains coming together and bringing back these wonderful artifacts that they got in trade uh, with these natives from the Northwest Coast. And they had, actually, if you go to the museum, you can still go into the old meeting hall. And, and that was, was, is, was the origin of that museum. When stories got back about the, the sea otters and the beavers, then that quickly started another industry. And people went over land as well as through sea to, to trade for the pelts. And the English and, and New England fleets brought back large numbers of sea otter pelts and beaver pelts. And actually the Hudson Bay Company had several outposts along the Northwest coast uh, to get primarily the sea otter pelts, but then they became an important a store for the for these Native Americans to get the various things they needed, like Hudson Bay blankets, became quite valuable in their culture. So this is a, a pipe, and you can see on that pipe the, the white face representing a Russian sailor. The hat is in the shape of a Russian sailor's hat. So as the contact occurred, it is reflected in the arc. This is the bowl of the pipe, and actually what they used was the gun barrels they, from the rifles that they traded from, for these, uh, uh, from these uh, Westerners, and actually those became the bowls of the pipe. Here is a carving, and again, this represents a sea captain from these fleets that they had contact with, the whaling fleets and the trading fleets from uh, the Western culture. Soon after they were colonized, the missionaries came along and uh, these were felt to be savages and they were going to make them convert them and assimilate them and the primary primarily these missionaries came from England and New England and they took these Indians away from their uh, native villages and put them in residential schools. Franz Boas, uh, anthropologist and the father of cultural anthropology, a German immigrant, wanted to study uh, un, uh, a culture that had not been significantly changed. So he did most of his work and went to the Northwest Coast and spent years there. He, the Northwest Coast, uh, did, the, these people did not have a written language. It was an oral tradition. But after Boaz was there for a number of years, he actually developed a written language. Some of the sounds uh, for that they speak are very difficult for us to recreate. But he wrote down, he developed a language for them, and he was the father of cultural anthropology and developed the term cultural relativism. And basically, the character of the individual is shaped by the cultural environment. And the other basic principle that he came up with was that even though this culture is different than ours, and we may consider it primitive, it is really not. And, and they had an incredible advanced culture just very, very different than what we are used to as, as Westerners. Franz Boas uh, did a lot of this work. He, he, uh, did, uh, he wrote and did a lot of uh, work for the Bureau of Ethnology and published significant, and we have some of his original books um, in, in great detail, talks about the fishing, the hunting, even has recipes 
and I'm not trying to recreate them, any of them, but, uh, but I'm, I'm going to one day. I just have to get all the ingredients, but recipes that they use in their cooking in the Northwest Coast. He subsequently went back and became a, a professor of anthropology at Columbia University in New York. Oh, and just one quick aside while I'm on this slide. Uh, we, one of our shows that Joan will show you the opening of uh, in, in her part of the discussion was at the Berkshire Museum in 2016. And we were so thrilled at the opening of that show to meet Boaz's granddaughter who lives in the Berkshires. And she was quite old at the time, and I don't know if she's still alive, but we had a wonderful time talking about her uh, grandfather and her impressions of her grandfather and, and the collection that he amassed after his exploration of the Northwest Coast. Well, these stories came back. And just like people today will look for exotic places to tour and go on vacation, uh, Antarctica, uh, Africa, this became an exotic place. And in the 1920s and 30s, the Northwest Coast was open to tourism. And these are some posters from that era, uh, Pan American World Airlines, Northwest Orient Airlines, both of them gone as airlines, but you can see how they all emphasized the land of the totem pole. And people came through here, and then the one on the right is from the Canadian Pacific Railroad uh, that still exists. As the tourists came, carvers from the, this region said, wow, we can sell some of our things. And so they, they would carve these totem poles and come down and meet the cruise ships or go to the airport and meet the new arrivals and sell these totem poles. The one in the middle uh, is by Charlie James, a very well-known carver from the 1920s and 30s. And this is one of the poles and this was considered folk art and not really highly collectible at the time, but today this is quite collectible. And uh, he would again meet the ships and be selling this right off the, the, the docks. Joan's gonna talk now a little bit about the culture of the Northwest Coast before we go back to some of the collection. I think it's um, important to realize that the culture was influenced by the environment in which these people lived. And since they lived basically in a grocery store, they didn't have to travel huge distances to get their food, they didn't have to carry their shelters on their backs. They could build their shelters and they could use them year round. So it, it gave them a lot of security and it also gave them a fair amount of free time during the long winters that exist in the Northwest. The other, the other thing about this culture that's very important to keep in mind is that it's a very spiritual culture. They, they live very close to nature and they respect nature because nature is, sustains their lives. So they respect it in the sense that everything that they deal with has a spirit within it. Um, when we ordered, when we uh, commissioned a totem pole, the artist sent us pictures of them going out into the woods to look for the tree that held the spirit of our pole so they could pick the appropriate tree to cut down and carve for us. So everything has a spirit. The animals, um, there are imaginary creatures uh, as there are in every culture, but everyone has a spirit. And even we have a spirit within us. So um, different clans will have different animal spirits that watch over them and that are part of their own clan. Um, and uh, each clan lives in a village and then what they do is they build these very large houses, which can hold everyone in the clan for, for ceremonies and, and special events, especially in the wintertime, but through the whole year. And even on the outside of these houses, there's decoration. So this uh, culture really enjoys visual stimulation and visual representation of the spirits that are in their world. On this uh, long house, which is what they're called, you can see you when you enter, you can see the, the entrance at the bottom. When you enter the house, you go right through a figure that's carved there. And on the sides of the house, 
their painted images that represent the clan so that when other peoples come in to the uh, area, they can see these from the water and they know where they're going. They're basically like signposts. On the edge of the longhouse, there's a figure of a man in a hat and he's called a watchman. Usually the figure of the watchman has three faces. They don't look to the mountains because you don't need protection, the mountains will protect you, but they look north and south and they look out to sea. Those are the places where your enemies can come from. And this, this shows how um, cedar is so important to this culture. They not only build the longhouses out of it, they not only carve their poles and their masks and all their decorative objects out of it, but they use it to make their canoes, which are so important for their livelihood. Every tribe has a slightly different design in the canoe. And that's because these different villages were, were relatively isolated from each other. There were no roads, there were no cars, there weren't even any horses with carts. So the only way to really get between one tribe and another, other than hiking through all of these woods, would be to go in canoe from one to another. And um, if you ever get to British Columbia, and uh, the University of British Columbia has an amazing art museum with Northwest Coast art. And in the back of the museum, they've recreated a village. So this is, this is a picture of that village and you can see the long houses with the totem poles. The one on the left has the three watchmen at the top. You can see the three little hats sticking up. And then there's a gate to protect it. So um, it's, it's a very interesting place. We've spent many days there. And talking about the poles, each clan has an animal that represents it. And some clans, some animals go with others. So the pole, the, these are not really huge totem poles. These are maybe six or seven foot poles. And um, they're used inside the house as well as outside the house. The one on the left is a raven, and you can see there's a large beak coming down. Do that again. Yeah. And um, on the wing is another representation of a bird. On the right is a pole that Paul and I commissioned that they had to find the spirit in the tree. And um, it's a beaver. The larger image is a beaver. You can always tell a beaver because he has big front teeth, and he's holding a stick, and he has a cross-hatched tail. And then in the legs of the beaver, there's a bird. Um, we wanted to have a beaver who is the shaman's helper and a raven because raven is very central to a lot of the stories of the Northwest. But um, when we contacted these artists, they said, no, we can't have a beaver and a raven. They don't go together. They're not in the right clans. And we said, but we, we've seen these on poles when we visited you know, Alaska, and they said, oh, no, no, those are the Pachyudal, they'll do anything for money. We're more traditional, we're Haida, we will not. So we can give you a beaver and an eagle, which is what we got. <laughs> the eagle has a smaller beak. And they said, you know, nobody's going to know it's an eagle. You can tell them it's a raven and they won't know any better. <laughs> so that's, that's the pole that we have in our home. And uh, in uh, the Northwest, we we took a cruise, an Alaskan cruise, which took us to a very special um, site. It used to be called Queen Charlotte Island, but it's been there for hundreds, maybe even a thousand years as a village. Um, and it's called Haida Gwaii now, where the Haida were and still are. And what, uh, what happens is they erect these poles, as we've shown you, and then they just go back to the earth. Because in this culture, there is no word or there was no word for art. Everything is done for a reason, to represent a spirit, to celebrate an event, it's used for something, and then it goes back to the earth. They, don't, they didn't have museums where they would put these places in and preserve them. So when you go to this very old site, which is considered sacred because it is so old, you can still see <clears throat> some of the very old poles as they're returning their spirits to the earth. And another, another part of this culture, which 
is in some way similar to what we have in the West is uh, the uh, shamans. Now there aren't any shamans today. I think the last shamans were maybe in the 20s, in the 1920s, maybe 100 years ago. But um, we did an exhibit at the Florida International University in Miami called Spiritual Healing, which was all about the shamans. And the reason there are so many pieces that exist in museums all around the world that were used by shamans is because the shamans were considered outsiders. They were very powerful people. They weren't allowed to live with the rest of the village. They lived separately, but they were called on when someone had lost their soul or when someone was very despondent. They were, uh, the way I look at them is they were kind of the psychiatrists of the tribe. They weren't called on for broken bones or rashes or anything like that. They were, they were more spiritual. And they had special regalia that they wore. They had uh, special masks, special rattles, special capes. They had um, deer hooves on the edges of their clothing, which would make noise when they were in their healing. They had uh, all kinds of amulets. They had tattoos that they wore. Basically, they had a uniform that was very impressive, much as we would be impressed when someone comes in with a white coat with a stethoscope hanging around their neck. That's our uniform. This was their uniform. I think theirs was much more impressive than ours. And what would happen, and they would have strange mannerisms and go into trances to try to heal people, and it's all very foreign to us, but it was all part of the spiritual part of their culture. And so what would happen was after they died, because their materials were so powerful, the uh, people of the village would put them in a box and take them way out into the forest and just abandon them because nobody wanted to be near them. There was too much power in them. So when anthropologists and explorers came into the region, they would come upon these boxes and find all of these all of this regalia, the masks and the rattles and all of the you know, things they used, and they would see that they were abandoned and take them back and put them into museums or you know, spread them around and sell them or whatever. And um, now these things are being repatriated back to the tribes because they are considered sacred. And these are some of the amulets that we have that had been used by shamans. Uh, they would hang them around their necks or use them to decorate the clothing, and they represent different spirits that would help the shaman in his healing process. And this is another amulet. These were made out of bone. Um, we have a friend who's an orthopedist who looked at this one and told us which part of the animal it came from, which bone. <laughs> but um, they're basically all bones that have been cleaned out. Um, and this is this, a very special tool for the shaman, it's called a soul catcher, because if someone stole, someone's soul is stolen, which can happen, then the shaman's job is to find that soul, put it into the soul catcher, and then bring it back to the patient and blow it back into them. This is a hollow piece of bone that's carved, usually with um, a symbol of two serpents, and um, you'll find these in museums pretty much. Uh, there aren't that many that are around in other places. The shamans also did nev never cut their hair. That was another thing that made them different. Uh, much like Samson had strength from his hair, the, the shamans got power from the fact that they didn't cut their hair. So they needed special combs to hold the hair back. So this is a shaman's comb. And what they did when they went into these trances is they would commune with all of their spirits. So as a representation of that, there are these objects called transformation masks, which represent the transformation of a shaman or a person into his spirit that's within him. So this particular mask is a raven mask, and it's um, about three feet long so that when it's opened, it becomes six feet across. And when it's open, you can see there's a figure of a face on the inside. 
And this is a shaman's rattle. It's a symbol of an owl. And the owl was a, a sign, was actually a symbol of death, but it was also a shaman's helper. And this is another piece of the shaman's regalia. It's a crown. Each arm of the crown in this particular one is carved. Um, in some of them, it's a bear claw. And every arm represents a different spirit helper. The most powerful shamans had eight spirit helpers. And this crown did have eight spirits on it. We owned this crown for a number of years. And every time I walked by it, I could, I, I'm sure I felt the power coming from it. So finally I said, we have to sell this. It needs to go back to a museum. It's too powerful to be in somebody's house. So now it's in a museum. And this is a, a shaman's necklace. that also has many charms hanging from it. And each, each amulet represents a different spirit. The uh, one with all the dots is an octopus. And the one next to it on the left is an otter. Otters were very feared by most people because they could transform from land to sea and they were capable of stealing someone's soul and carrying it back into the sea. And this is, this is a classic shaman rattle. It could only be used by a shaman and it's an image of an oyster catcher. On the back of the oyster catcher is a shaman at the, at the back who is capturing a witch and torturing a witch to get the soul back that the witch has stolen. So he's, he's hanging, he's holding onto the witch's hair and pulling her back. And then there's also a bear and a ram on the back of, this, of the oyster catcher. And the oyster catcher is related to the shaman because it goes in different spirit worlds. It goes from the sky into the sea to catch the oyster, and then it goes to land where it, it cracks open the oyster. So it, it transforms to, creature, to a creature in all these different realms, and that's why it's so powerful. So I'm going to discuss the potlatch, and potlatch is unique to these cultures. Um, it, what, and we're going to talk about the purpose of it, but unfortunately, for almost 70 years, it was banned in, by the Canadian government, and we'll talk about that ban in a, a bit as well. So the potlatch with these celebrations that were several days, sometimes even weeks, in which one chief would invite neighboring tribes to come to their village and they would give the, these other people, these visitors to their village, gifts. You can see here, this is an old picture and you can see the kind of gifts. These are like pots and pans. These aren't gifts that you might give to somebody important today. These are very practical. Things. They would give flour and blankets and all sorts of things like that. And, and the kind of gift an individual got from a neighboring tribe was directly related to their status within the tribe. The potlatch was, was given for a number of purposes. Uh, it would be to pass on inheritance of physical things like regalia. So when a chief's rattle was passed down to another, to his uh, uh, son, it would uh, that would be a reason to give a potlatch. It would be uh, a time to, in, uh, when hunting grounds were passed on from one individual to another. But one of the most important things, one of the most valuable things that they passed along were not tangible things, but intangibles. The right to uh, have a particular dance, the right to tell a, particular, tell a particular story, or the right to sing a particular song were very valuable. And if a chief, if the chief owned the story, nobody else could tell that story from his tribe or neighboring tribes unless they, they received it as an inheritance. It also was used for celebrating many things, marriages, baby namings, and so forth. It would also be a way to claim a reputation. The more potlatches you give, the more re, uh, esteemed you are as a chief. And finally, it would be used as a memorial for an important person that died within the tribe. It also played a role in the economy. So in the West, we basically have a market economy where goods and services are exchanged for currency. And then that currency is used to buy other goods and services. The Northwest Coast had two kinds of economy. The barter economy, so as you remember, 
they traded uh, goods with the Wagley fleets and with the Westerners that came to visit them. And so they would trade goods for other goods. But they also had what was called the gift economy, and that's the potlatch economy. So when, when you went to visit your neighboring tribe, you received gifts. And they were given to you freely. You didn't have to pay for them. You didn't have to give any other gifts or services. But you were expected to sometime in the future, your tribe was expected to hold their own potlatch and invite your host over to your place and give some gifts back. So the gifts kept circulating goods in certain, among these uh, different tribes. And so it really created a, a, a third kind of an economy that was very different than the other two. Plus it also allowed for um, more peaceful meetings between the different tribes. So again, the, the more potlatches a chief gave, the more prestige he had. But then he wanted to show that by what they're called potlatch rings. So in the center picture is a chief's hat. Then this has no potlatch rings on it. And you can see how nicely it's painted uh, and woven. The one on the left has four potlatch rings. So that particular chief that owned that hat, over the course of his reign as chief of the tribe, gave four potlatches. That's pretty, pretty good. The one on the right only has three. Some of the times there were so many rings that they would actually bend the hat over a little bit. It was so heavy with rings. So those two hats on the edges, those were pretty well-known chiefs at the time that owned those hats. They would give huge feasts and have hundreds of people over. And so they would have special bowls and special serving pieces. Uh, like Joan likes to say, it's like bringing out the good china and the good silver. And the one on the top is a model of a potlatch feast bowl. It's only about two or three feet long, the model that we have. The actual feast bowl, and there's a picture of it that's modeled after, is so large, you can see it had to be rolled out on wheels. And to get an idea of how much it felt, volume each one of those bowls holds, there's a child sitting in one of them. So this would be rolled out and the the, your visitors will be served a feast from that, those big bowls. And these are the serving pieces. The serving pieces for these special occasions were made from spoons and, horn. Uh, excuse me, horn. Uh, these are spoons and ladles. And this piece over here is actually another bowl that we use for condiments. The one in the center is, just to give you an idea what they were like, this is an image of an eagle the one on the top, and then beautifully carved. They would soften the horn in boiling water and then hammer it into molds to get the shape, and then it, this intricate carving would be placed on it, again, to invoke the spirit of these animals to help them in their, their celebration. Probably the most valuable possession uh, within the uh, potlatch were these coppers. They did mine copper, and every copper had the same shape, there'd be this T, raised T ridge through it. They carved the top part. These parts were always left unadorned. And sometimes the chief, to show how wealthy he was and the prestige that he had, would say, well, this valuable copper means nothing to me, and he'd break off a piece and give it to another chief. There were dances and stories told during the potlatch. And during the dances, it'd be drums. These are drums uh, he held it, it, in the hand of hide and they'd beat on them. Uh, this is an old one. These are new, this is a, a more contemporary one that you can see around the edges. This is a drum, but it's called a, a bentwood box drum. This stands about four feet tall. You can see in the top, this is a rope. So this would be suspended and the, the sound would be created by banging on the inside of this box and would carry over the water. This was often used to greet other tribes as they came in because it created the loud, loudest sound of any of these uh, musical implements. Like everything in, in this culture, it was adorned with images. So this particular box that we have is, this represents the octopus, and this is the tentacles and the suckers of the octopus, and the octopus is holding a salmon. This box is very special. It's, it's what's called the bedwood box because the box is constructed of one piece of wood and that's scored in the corners. These are called kirks. 
So they would cut three quarters of the way through the, the thickness of the wood. Then they would heat it uh, and it would be, you could bend the wood without breaking it. And so this box was attached to only one of the corners and the others were bent with these curves. There's, there's something else that I wanted to mention because I'm sure there's some people who are interested in the art form. And this art form is very specific to the Northwest Coast peoples. You can see in the images that are on the box, there are circular shapes, oval shapes, and um, squared off shapes. And a lot of these are almost, um, Formal. well, they are, but they're almost like self-portraits because these people have very thick eyebrows and kind of uh, high cheekbones. And you can see that in a lot of their masks and images. But also these form lines were um, developed and, and exist in all of the tribes to one form or another. And you, you will not find them anywhere else. This is a, a whistle. And this is a, actually a contemporary whistle, but this was danced in a potlatch um, not that long ago. Uh, and uh, we, we got it when the, the chief had died and his, his widow was bringing it into a dealer we were visiting in Vancouver at the time. And he didn't even have a chance to put it out on display. We was by a very well-known carver. Well, let's get to what the Canadian government did. So in, 1980, in 1885, they passed the Canadian Indian Act. And basically what it said was every Indian or person who engages in or assists in celebrating the Indian festival known as the potlatch, and that other word there, tamana na was, is the native word for potlatch, is guilty of a misdemeanor and shall be liable to imprisonment. Why did they do this? And there's a spe and some speculation. One, they felt that because this was so central to the culture, if they banned it, it would aid in assimilation. Some more generous First Nation uh, people now say that, well, they just didn't understand. They thought it was cannibalistic because some of the dancers talked about cannibal birds. Uh, they just didn't understand the, how important this was to us. But in any event, it was banned in 1885. Potlatches, however, still occurred and were underground, if you will. Uh, so they were still celebrated quietly, except this famous potlatch given Christmas Day, 1921. So Chief Dan Kramer at Alert Bay, which is off the north coast of Vancouver Island, felt that Christmas Day would be a good day to have a potlatch because the uh, Christians were busy celebrating Christmas and that hopefully they wouldn't be uh, uh, get wind of their potlatch. So he invited over 300 people from neighboring tribes to come to Alert Bay and celebrate it. Unfortunately, word did get out and the Indian Nation found out and the authorities came they arrested 45 organizers of the potlatch and confiscated 750 ceremonial objects. And you must realize that these objects that come out for the potlatch are considered their most sacred objects, the most valuable objects. To add insult to injury, they then displayed them in the Anglican church in Alert Bay. They invited the white people in the area to come and see them in charge of the mission. They then sold the artifacts to museums all around the world and basically separated this collection. Well, with the, our more a modern sensitivity to what these people went through, all but 33 of them were eventually repat repatriated and they formed the core of two very, very significant collections. One of them, the Umista collection, is at the site of this potlatch in Alert Bay. Umista is the native term for a return of something important. And Joan and I visited the Umista collection. One of our pieces is at their collection now that Joan will tell you the story of. This is uh, a picture on the lower right of Dan Cranmer's grandson with one of the repatriated pieces. And you can see, you can just tell what these were in cotton gloves and the reverence that he has as this piece is being returned home to Umista. And this is a modern potlatch, so they still do give potlatches today, not to the degree that they did years ago, but it still exists within the culture. So the next section, Joan's going to talk a little bit about the stories that were very, very important to the Northwest Coast and do give meaning to the art. So um, as Paul said, 
the most important thing that a chief owned were his stories. And these would be told on special occasions. But the stories are represented in the art of the area. So as you were looking at this picture, you can see that it's a, if you were from a, a foreign culture or the moon, and you would, you would see it and you would say, well, that's an interesting picture. It has pairs of animals and they're going onto this very large structure that might be a boat. And that's, that's kind of interesting. But if you know the story that this picture represents, it gives it more meaning. So when you look at the pieces from the Northwest Coast, you have to realize that all of these pieces are very interesting and they're colorful and they're dramatic but they also tell stories. And if you know the stories, it gives them that much more meaning. So these are pictures from the potlatch where the stories are told. And this is a picture of the entrance to an exhibit that we did at the Berkshire Museum a few years ago that was basically based on the premise I just told you, that all the pieces have stories. And it's an exhibit that no one had done before but I thought it was very important to get across that concept. So every culture has stories. There's stories in the Bible, there are Greek mythology, there are stories that go back hundreds and thousands of years, and the native coast also has, the, the Northwest coast also has stories. So many of them are used to explain what happens in the natural world, how things were created, how man came to be, how the sun came, and I'll tell you the story about the mosquito. There are also stories that um, teach morality. There are stories that talk about the social order and how things are supposed to be. Um, there are stories that are used in coming of age ceremonies. And also they're just used for entertainment because when you have a very long winter, there's not a whole lot to do. So you spend a lot of time telling the stories, which is probably why they're so important. So, um, there is in the forest, because we know that they were very aware of nature in the forest, there was a very large creature, a woman called Sinopla. She had blood red lips. She had big eyes. She wasn't very bright. She had long scraggly hair and she would walk around the woods and she would help care for the animals, make sure everything was going nicely for the animals. But if she saw a small child, she would capture the small child and throw it into her burden basket, take it home to her cottage and eat it. So this is kind of like the boogeyman. You know, you have to, you tell your children about Sinopolis so they won't go wandering alone into the forest. Um, so the story goes, and there are stories about Sinopla in every single tribe. And they're all a little bit different, but they all, they exist in all the tribes. And um, the one that I like talks about how Sinopla was in the forest and she found this boy and girl and she picked them up and took them home. And as she's getting ready, to, she's stoking the fire and building it up so she can cook the children. She notices that the little girl has very nice earrings in her ears. So she says to the little girl, those earrings are very pretty. And the little girl, being very smart, says, uh, well, I'd be happy to give you my earrings but they're for pierced ears and your ears are not pierced. So Sinopla gets sad and she says, but you know, if, if you would like, I could pierce your ears for you and then you could wear my earrings. And all I need is a very sharp steak. So Sinopla gets her the sharp steak and then the little girl says, well, you're so huge. You have to lay down on the floor and put your head on the floor. I can't reach you when you're standing up. So Sinopla lays down on the floor, puts her head down on the floor floor and, and the little girl takes the stake and drives it into her ear so hard that she's stuck to the floor and she can't hurt the children. And then the parents finally come and they see what's happened and they take Sinopla and they throw her into the fire. And as she's dying, she says, you may think you're rid of me, but I will come back and suck your blood. And out of the fire come ashes, which turn into mosquitoes. So that's why mosquitoes suck our blood. And this is a mask of a mosquito. And also just to remind you of the burden basket, she had a very large one because she was a large creature. And 
it's important to realize that this is not a dead culture that we're talking about, something where you see the artifacts in a museum like the ancient Egyptians. This is a living culture. And the uh, First Nations are teaching their children about this culture and the stories continue to be told and the potlatches continue to be given. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the first exhibit we did and show you some of that. Uh, let me just mention that of the three exhibits we did, this was the most comprehensive. This had over 200 pieces in, in the exhibit. Joan, with her background in anthropology, actually co-curated all three exhibits. Um, this one was in History Miami Museum, and the organization of the exhibit, uh, Joan, Joan and I actually went to the National Museum of American Indian, and we used their research library, and Joan also went to the Library of Congress and created a curatorial notebook, which is very interesting, and Joan helped design the organization of this exhibit organized on in five different areas. There was the sea, the land, and the air. And you'll, I'll show you uh, examples of those three. Then there was a whole section on ceremonies, like the potlatch and a hamatsa ceremony, which I'll briefly discuss. And then there was a section on contemporary art that echoed back to the old art forms, but used contemporary techniques and materials to bring it to another level as fine art. So this is the entrance of the exhibit. And at, at the time, this is a docent giving a tour. It was and still remains one of the best attended exhibits that was shown at this museum. It received a lot of uh, press and, and uh, notoriety at the time. So this is from the sea. And this is a mass by a well-known carver, Willie Seawee. Now, they did not sign their work because it was carved for a purpose, not for art, but it was carved for ceremonial purposes. However, some of this early carvings uh, could be identified to an individual because of the technique used. And Willie Seaweed, you can't see it here in the picture, but when he put his circle in as a form line, he was the first one to use a compass. And if you look really closely to the actual piece itself on this, this uh, lateral fin, there's actually a little tiny compass holes here uh, that, and, and in the other circles on this piece that uh, can be a, help us trace this to Willie Seaweed. This was done in the early 20th century. This is from the section on the ear. And this represents, this is a modern image of a, uh, a carving of a sun. This is the moon. And the two figures in the middle are Thunderbirds. Now Thunderbirds are mythic creatures. They're the only creatures that can kill the killer whale. And they uh, send out lightning snakes that are the weapon they use to get the whale. This is from the land, and the most important creature of the land, the three images in the middle, are beaver. By the way, this one over here is Sonopa, another representation with her pursed red lips. And she actually, a picture of her was on a calendar in Canada. I think she was Miss October. <laughs> and this is the Hamatsa Mass, and this was a, a coming of age ceremony. There were three different masks in the Hamatsa ceremony. This is a raven, and this is another raven. The two in the bottom uh, represent the crooked beak of heaven, and this is a mask called a hukuk, which is a mythical creature. This mask is interesting because it was carved during the time that the potlatch was banned. And in order to carve, and I don't know if you have any of you ever worked with wood, but when you first get wood, it's green. And if you carve it right away, it will start to crack. So carvers, what they would do would get the wood, they'd let it age a little bit, and then they would carve it and paint it. Well, this one, because it was done during the time of the ban, was carved and painted when it was green. And as a result, it has lots of cracks in it and native repairs. So it's not as elaborate as the other, but it tells a very important story of the time that the potlatch was banned. These are a number of the totem poles we have. The one on the left is about seven feet tall. It was owned by Senator John Warner of Virginia. The one in the center was uh, stood in front of the Hudson Bay uh, store in Vancouver. 
this is a mortuary pole with a white face depicting somebody that had recently died. And this one was a pole that was collected by missionaries to Haynes, Alaska. And these actually aren't the full totem poles. The full totem poles would be 15 or 20 feet tall. These are model poles. So much like a, a sculptor would do a maquette, a small model of the sculpture before they do the big one, the, um, the artist would do a small pole, which could be maybe four or five feet tall. And then if that was approved, they would go ahead and carve the big pole. So this is a little more detail of that pole on the right, the one that was collected in Haynes. And at the top of the three watchmen, remember Joan talked about it was not necessary for them to have a watchman look towards the mountains to the east. So they would look, and this pole would be oriented looking, one north, one south, and one out to sea to the west. The second image down is a beer. He is eating a sea otter, and below him is another, I mean a land otter, and below him is another land otter. And then the bottom image is a very common image in, in the Northwest Coast, it's beer mother. And the beer is very protective of its young, and actually the beer is supposed to protect humans as well. So it's a beer holding a humanoid figure on the bottom. The canoes were different shapes from different tribes. They're all basically the same uh, shape, but you can see they're adorned with different things. So here is a carving on the bow of this one. This one has this little protuberance. This one, you can see that shape. And each tribe had their own, and clan had their own particular shape of a canoe. And the top picture is a ceremonial oar. The oars they actually used were not carved like that. Argillite is a material unique to this region as well. There's only one quarry on Queen Charlotte Island now called Hideaway. And argillite is like a shale that can be carved into these very, very beautiful images and very detailed. So it's a stone, but when you carve it, you get these great, great images. And these were used ceremonially. So Aldona Genitis, and one of the wonderful experiences we've had with this collection and with our interests is we've met great people from academia, uh, from auction houses, uh, from dealers, and other collectors. So Aldona Genitis, uh, we, she was actually at our home in Miami a couple of times. She was the previous, the assistant director of the American Museum of Natural History in New York, subsequently went to Alaska, became director of the University of Alaska Museum, and she's an anthropologist by training. And what she said was, unlike most other North American native groups, the present day artists of the Northwest Coast maintain intimate ties with earlier artistic tradition. So this is an old button blanket. It always had the red and the black wool. It had buttons, which you can't see real clearly in this image, but buttons, all these adornments are, are actually white buttons that they use. And this was worn as a cape. Here is a modern interpretation of one uh, where you see the red, and the black, but you have other colors of, of the wool. You have aluminum, you have pounded copper, you have bead beadwork. There are there's some shells here. There are still some buttons, but you can see how Hazel Simeon has taken this form to a different level. These are basket, and basketry was very important. They used seagrass to weave these baskets, very fine. They would be watertight. And they put this, these beautiful geometric patterns on them. So these are old baskets. These are glass blown to represent baskets done by a, a, a glass artist, Preston Singletary, that actually trained in uh, Seattle with Chihuly. This hat I showed you before, this is a chief's hat. But what Preston Singletary did was take that hat blow it out of glass, flipped it over, and it became a bowl. And then what he did further, and it's, you, can't, you can barely make it out here, uh, it's etched in the glass, and when a strong light shines through it, the shadow on the ground becomes a bird. So this is the beak of the bird, here's the tail of the bird, and this represents the wing of the bird with the light shining down through that etching. There is a lot of contemporary jewelry. Joan is wearing some of it, and um, can't see it, <laughs> you can't see it, but this is a piece that's in our collection. And so this is a pendant and a chain stored within the pendant representing a moon and a sun. And it sits in that little piece 
when Joan doesn't wear it, so it actually is a, a form of art. Yeah, and it tells a story just like everything else of the raven who gave the sun to the world. So before we conclude and, and open it up for questions and comments, uh, Joan wants to tell you one of our best stories and one of our best experiences about the Mr. Cultural Center that I mentioned previously. So we, we owned a chill cat blanket. Yeah, sure. And uh, this is a ceremonial cape. The one that we owned was uh, made, hand woven by a woman whose name was Mary Ebbets Hunt and her native name was Anislaga. She was a princess from one tribe who married a chief from another tribe and lived in Haida Gwaii. She had 12 children and she made one blanket for each of the children. Our particular blanket apparently was lost when the children were taken from the home, put in two residential centers. One child apparently got very ill and died and the blanket just disappeared. We got it at an auction and uh, decided to sell it maybe 10 years ago. And I went to uh, Christie's and they said, well, we don't do native auctions anymore, call this dealer. So I called the dealer and he said, I told him what we had. And he said, well, you need to call Christie's. So uh, he gave me the name of a specific person who did auctions in Paris. So I spoke to her and she was very anxious to have the blanket. So we took it up to New York and she shipped it off to Paris and put it in the catalog with a picture of Anislaga with a picture that was done, a photograph that had been taken by Edward Curtis of a chief wearing the blanket and uh, the whole history of, of the piece, which is called the provenance. And the, it, it was a terrific auction, but the blanket didn't sell. So she called me up and she said, well, we have three offers. After post auction, some people think they can get a bargain if they wait and if something doesn't sell, they offer you a price. Two of the auctions were cash. One was, uh, they won't tell you who's doing the offering, but they said, uh, these people are offering you your full price, but they have to wait to see if they can get the money from the Canadian government. So you might have to wait a long time for this. And I said, well, I think we should wait. I said, that's, that's okay, we'll wait. So it, it took about six months and finally, she called me and said, well, they, they got the money. I'm sending you the check and I'm sending them the blanket. And I said, wait, I said, can you tell me who got the blanket? So she called me back and she said, yes. And they want to know who you are. So we communicated and she said it was the Omista Cultural Center, which I had never heard of. And she said, and if you go on YouTube, you can see the welcome home party they had for the blanket. So we went on YouTube. And they had it on a table because they couldn't afford to build this beautiful case for it at that time. And they were all in their special regalia and their special costumes with their rattles and their drums, dancing and singing around the blanket. And the director of the cultural center got on the, the tape and she said, um, we only heard about the auction the day before. And we knew that we couldn't get this blanket that we really wanted. Um, unless it didn't sell at auction and that the sellers were willing to wait for us to get the money and we got it from the Canadian government. And she said the spirit of Anislava was watching over this blanket to make sure that it came home. So a couple of other point, uh, things in the story. The National Post you can see uh, on the right side of the slide is the Canadian equivalent of USA Today. It's a national newspaper. And in 2014, when it was returned home to Amista, um, that was the uh, uh, important anniversary of the country of Canada. It was 100th in celebrating their centennial, their 100th year. And so they really wanted to repatriate with their Native American culture and with the British culture. And so this was a headline from the National Post when the bank blank was repatriated. And finally, um, in that video that Joan alluded to, the granddaughter of Anna Slaga is a weaver, a present day weaver in the community. And she was weaving a contemporary bank blanket next to her grandmother's old blanket, great grandmother. And she said, my great grandmother's spirit is guiding my hands that I do this weaving. It was a very beautiful experience seeing that. And we actually had the opportunity 
to visit the Mista Cultural Center. The director came in on her day off to greet us and show us how this blanket is now the centerpiece of this museum. And if you remember what I told you earlier about the, the, the when all that special material is repatriated, this museum has fabulous material and this is their prized possession. And one last thing I wanna add, we were sorry that we had to sell this blanket, but when we downsized from our condominium to, from our house to a condominium, it just wouldn't fit. This takes up a whole wall, but we're glad that it has a home and we're glad that it returned to its home. So let me get to the conclusion here. And I wanna show you a video actually from, from the Umista Cultural Center. And I'm gonna guide you through the video and it brings up many of the points that we talked about uh, during the course of the lecture. It's a great summary. So as the points are coming up in the video, it's about a minute and a half long, I'm gonna, you'll follow the little dot go down and you'll see what they're talking about. So let's start with the ancestral tradition. And whoops, and okay, where's it? Why is it not running? Let me get this going. Uh, here we go. The My arrow. people, the Kwakwa Kiwok, have been guided by our ancestors. Our stories of origin are based on our first ancestors. Ceremonial masks tell of our beginning and share our identity and where we come from. When one's heart is glad, he gives away gifts. It was given to us by our creator, our way of doing things, of who we are. The potlatch was given to us as a way of expressing joy. Everyone on earth is given something. This was given to us. Today, most potlatches are held as memorials for loved ones. Morning songs are sung to shake off the sadness, wipe away tears, and set the spirit free. So, to, strip, to end where we began, I'd like to read this quote and then we'll open up for any comments or questions. Images seem to speak to the eye but they are actually addressed to the mind. They are ways of thinking in the guise of seeing. The eye can sometimes be satisfied with form alone, but the mind can only be satisfied with meaning. And so it's really the search for meaning that has intrigued us over the years. As we've accumulated the collection and continue to add to it, we are continually doing research and reading and talking to people to find out more about the meaning of this art form. And so with that, uh, we'll open it up for questions and comments. Uh, if anybody would like to contact us afterwards, uh, these, our emails, and this will stay on the slide while, while Phil uh, moderates any comments or questions. Great, well, first of all, uh, on behalf of uh, all of us, I uh, thank you so much for what really is a, a riveting and a tremendously uh, inspiring presentation. I, I must admit, I've got pages of notes here. And <laughs> uh, one of the treats about being able to moderate the questions is I, I, I can always put my questions first, but <laughs> I, 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 will, I will try to uh, acknowledge the audience's questions uh, too as they've come along. Uh, one of the things I was quite interested in is this distinction between art that is made for trade uh, with others, uh, particularly, let's say, white traders or whatever, and uh, tourists, uh, and the, the art that is actually art used first uh, that happens to take on the quality of collectible art. And can you talk about that dynamic and how it's reflected in your collection? Sure. Uh, yeah. So. It, the tourist art 
doesn't have the same significance to the tribe. You know, it's, it's like, I don't know, another culture in, in, to give you the sand paintings at the Southwest, and I don't know if you know about them, but, but sand paintings are, are very important, very spiritual, and then they get destroyed, but there are sand paintings you can buy that are actually preserved, They're, they change the image a bit. So the real significant art, the art of the shaman, for example, were not to be sold. Uh, that some of it was stolen. Uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania has a wonderful collection that's literally stolen from the Northwest Coast. Uh, but now the contemporary art is being made for collectors. The older art is, is a lot of it's being repatriated. Uh, it's interesting if we put our art in museums, if a museum owned our art, it could be repatriated because we own it individually, it's not on display except for an occasional exhibition. Um, it, it, they, they cannot repatriate it. Interestingly, the exhibit Joan did at the Florida International University on Shamanism, we were a bit concerned because we got a call from the director of the museum that some Native Americans from the Northwest Coast were coming to visit the exhibit. Yeah, inspect. Inspect it, and we were concerned that they might ask to repatriate it. So the, the, the Repatriation Act has some, some impact on the ability of people to collect certain things, and some things you can no longer collect. But as, as to what's in our collection, when we collect, it's basically because we like it aesthetically, and then it's if it fits into the range of what we're looking for, because you know you can, you can only have so many spoons. Once you have a service for 12, it's enough. Mm -hmm. So we don't tend to buy more unless it's something that's really beautiful, whether it's for tourists or not. Uh, se several people asked about um, what I would say collections management questions, mm -hmm. uh, such as uh, dealing with uh, delicate objects. Uh, I guess humidity might be a factor or uh, colors and uh, what kind of colors were used. And I sometimes I'm thinking of Antiques Roadshow. There's, <laughs> always, there's always somebody who says, you know, ah, yes, well, I can tell it's after 1860 because these are synthetic colors. Are these issues that you look at? Yes. And, and so the, the older pieces are natural dyes. And then similar to a lot of other work, they did start using synthetic paints in the more new in the newer pieces. Um, you got to remember, this is cedar. And so when we had that pole commissioned, and so it's coming from the Northwest Coast, and our other home is in Miami. Heat and humidity, very different than the Northwest Coast. The, uh, the carvers told us, keep it wrapped in plastic for a year to let it acclimate. And even now that pole is now up in our home in the Berkshires. And if you look at it, it's almost like it's alive. You'll see the you see cracks open and close. And actually, we had friends and recently visiting, and they looked at it and said, Oh, this pole has this big crack. I said, if you come back in six months, the crack will close up. But you, you know, heat, humidity, light are all factors. Uh, we have cases made with UV uh, protective materials. And we really don't keep these in direct sunlight, especially some of the older material. Uh, one, uh, I think I put this up in the comments, a wonderful book I read a number of years ago, which you may know is Tony Horowitz's book called Blue Latitudes, uh, which has a lot to say about Captain Cook. But one of the things he talks about is that uh, about um, cultural uh, exchange uh, across the Pacific. Uh, and I was looking at those totem poles, and all of a sudden I had this flash of Easter Island mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and, and said to myself, well, you know, is there anything to it? What, what are your thoughts about that, the question of cultural exchange uh, among and around the region? So cultural exchange was definitely happening. So remember I showed you the contemporary blanket uh, by Hazel Simeon with lots of beads. Right. We didn't have beads in the Northwest Coast. Right. And so that was basically the Athabascans, which were further inland, traded with them, and that's where the beads came from. Buttons were not in the old, old Northwest Coast pieces, but that was from their contact with the Western captains and seamen and other Westerners. All of a sudden, they said, oh, are these buttons we can get? And so they got buttons. So uh, you, absolutely. Go ahead. And the other, the other thing that I've noticed is even the art of the Maori, Oh, the Maori, yeah. Yeah, from, from New Zealand has right. a lot of very similarities in the lines and the forms that they use. 
So I think there really was some uh, communication, even long distance across the oceans. Yes, I think I, th I think uh, uh, Horowitz makes a very powerful uh, uh, case for that, and uh, your pointing out of the Maori connection uh, is 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 uh, it's very evocative of the tattoos. Uh, is there a lot of, by, by the way, is there tattoos, scarification, body modification uh, of, among the First Nations? Yes. Oh, yes, but, but not, not in the contemporary, not today, but that was very important. Yeah, the tattoos were, were especially the shamans had lots of tattoos. But. No. Uh, but what, are, what are the uh, social issues and strains and stresses of the 20th and 21st centuries uh, on, on, the, on the First Nations? So it's very interesting because we had done a National Geographic exploration cruise, and that's how we got to Haida Gwaii, and we had a chance to really talk to them. Uh, they, for a long time, they couldn't vote. They did not have a vote in Canada uh, up until 1960. So they were considered second-class citizens. Hmm. They eventually got the vote, and now what's happening is similar to what, well, not similar, actually a lot better, they are getting their, their native land back. So Joan mentioned Queen Charlotte Island is now called Haida Gwaii. And these First Nation people are directly involved in land management on their land. Before they couldn't vote, the, the Canadian government took over all the, everything from them. Now they're getting self-determination back as a culture. And it's, it's really an important time for these cultures. They're also allowed to teach their native language. For years, they weren't allowed to speak it, so they can pass on their culture. And you know, it was it was really dying. Mm -hmm. So many of the people who knew the language and knew the stories were dying off, but they were able to maintain it. And now it's it's growing, and they actually teach some of their native languages in their schools. And case in point, if you you missed a cultural center that we mentioned several times, this is to preserve the culture of the, this area. Yeah, and they have they have a lot of medical issues. Much, much like uh, the Native Americans in the Southwest, there's a higher incidence of diabetes and, and alcoholism, a lot of problems. Are there organizations that people can support that you recommend that uh, uh, contribute in that area? Well, the mister we mentioned, but, but they do have social organizations, uh, and I don't know any offhand that I could recommend to you to Phil or any of the listeners, but yeah, they, they do, and, they, and it's all being done to preserve the culture for future generations. Sure. Um, I need to just do a, to do a time check. Uh, am I, uh, uh, I have us at 4.30. Uh, what's, uh, how much time do we have available? I have more questions, but. <laughs> Uh, hey, Phil, yeah, you're, we, we have nothing else on the roster afterwards. Okay, you know, well, well, if you want. Great, okay. Well, uh, I'll, I'll go out and get myself a drink and we can just rattle on, <laughs> uh, we, we can just rattle, rattle on through. Uh, and I'll, I'll go back and take a look as, uh, after the next question to, because I know I've overlooked some, some, some good questions on chat. Um, one of my favorite books, which I just reread recently, is Joseph Campbell, uh, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, uh, where he takes a look at archetypal stories. Uh, and I love the one about the mosquito and nailing the, Thank you. Uh, uh, I've always felt that about mosquitoes. <laughs> uh, are, are there other stories that you would identify as being sort of archetypal stories of uh, creation or uh, other, oh. other sorts of events that, that are important in the civilization. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Every, every culture has a creation story. And the creation story in the Northwest involves the raven finding a clamshell on, this, on the shore and hearing noise coming from the clamshell. And he goes over and pecks it open and out comes man. And, and, so. and, and similar to, to Genesis, the raven brings sun to, to the dark earth from the spirit on high. I mean, if you look, even look, forgetting about the native tradition, look at the jail Christian tradition, uh, tradition, many of these things are done for the same reason. Where did man come from? Where did the sun come from? You know, how did the earth get created? And there, there are parallel stories in, in the First Nation cultures. Uh, over the years, my wife and I have spent a lot of time in um, 
uh, in in Mexico, uh, in northern central, and down in the Chiapas region. And uh, there's a very strong tradition of the Cuandero, who are the healers. Uh, uh, they're the ones who, and they have wonderful, uh, uh, for example, the way you uh, cure a headache uh, is to take an egg, rub it on your head, and, and that will extract uh, things into your uh, into your forehead, uh, which I, I, I find works better than a leave. But uh, um, are there uh, folk traditions uh, like that uh, that you see in the uh, contemporary society of First Nations people that, that you can look at and say, oh, well, that goes right back to some earlier tradition? That one, I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know. I mean, in our visit and in our interaction with some of the First Nation people, they're very much westernized and modernized. And, and right. They'll go to the doctor for their headaches, not, not pull out their eggs. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, I know that, I know that um, they had a tradition of uh, going into the woods and fasting and eating certain plants to go into a trance. And that was done to find their own spirit. You know, the animal spirit that was in them, they would have a revelation and find their spirit. I really don't know if that's done to this, in this day. It's done a lot in, uh, still in the American uh, uh, Southwest and uh, into, uh, into Oaxaca. And some of it came uh, I, I think even the late 60s and, 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 and 70s as, as uh, uh, American hippies were experimenting with, uh, uh, with peyote and other right. things like that. But I think that there's still a, a very serious and, and uh, uh, meaningful uh, tradition, uh, at, uh, certainly at, at work uh, in and around, uh, in and around uh, Chiapas. Uh, a question coming up, uh, which is, um, it, are there books? Let me put it a, a different way. If I could only read one book, <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> not 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 two books or four books. If if I could only read one book that would be the best thing on this topic, what what would you recommend? So, uh, not because she's a friend, but Aldona Junaitis, uh that I mentioned during the course of my. The, yeah, she has a number of them that, that bridge, with her background in anthropology, bridge the gap between art, culture, the environment, uh, and it's Aldona, A-L-D-O-N-A, yeah. Jonitis, J-O-N-A-T-I-S. And I think she's published three or four books. Um, one of them talks about like the posters I showed you about tourism, about modern people and, and all the totem poles that appear on mugs. But she does have some more serious books talking about uh, the culture, the art, and the environment, similar to what we talked about today. So and, any of her books I think would be terrific and, and she's an excellent uh, writer. Great, thank you. Uh, I think I've just figured out uh, how to allow somebody else to talk who's raised their hand. And uh, Don Shapiro has been very patient because I just now figured out which button to hit. So let's see how this works. Oh, there he is. Okay. He has to unmute. Oh, ask, ask to unmute. He has to unmute himself, I guess. I think so. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah, yes, 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 John, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, a little while ago, you said, I think, that if you have one of these works of art, and you leave it to a museum or a museum acquires it, it can be repatriated. Depending upon, oh, go ahead. We have a Preston Singletary that we bought in Seattle some 15 years ago. And um, it has been left to a local museum along with all of our, the rest of our art collection when we die. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that it can be repatriated once the museum owns it? No, no. So these these would be things that were owned by shaman, most importantly, uh, or grave goods yeah. or bones, yeah. uh, funeral pieces. Something I, something that that the tribe deems to be culturally relevant uh, or sacred 
can be repatriated. Um, if if I, I went to the um, uh, National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C., I went to their storage area. They have a Native American sitting there guarding the collections, and uh, they regularly have Natives visiting to repatriate those pieces that they deem are um, spiritually significant for the tribe. So, so Don, you're, you're Preston Singletary, and his work is beautiful, is not in danger of going back to, to the tribe. But if you had a shamanic piece that was stolen from a shaman's grave and went to a museum, then it would be in danger of being repatriated. OK, thank you. You're welcome. It sounds like the British Museum has a lot to answer for. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, let me see here. Uh, looking forward um, to, uh, let me see, where's, where was this question? Well, the, uh, this was more uh, looking forward uh, uh, to the future. Uh, what do you see as the biggest uh, cultural challenges uh, that the First Nation peoples uh, have? So there are, there are two challenges that I would see, and I don't know if anyone wants to add one. One is assimilation and losing the culture. So, you know, th there's a big effort now to try to preserve the culture uh, so young people can learn the tradition and the language, but it's an issue. Uh, the other one is the medical issue. And so there are some very significant health issues, uh, like we have in our American Health, uh, American Indian Native Health Service, uh, diabetes, uh, um, um, substance abuse, hypertension are more prevalent among these people for a number of reasons. I don't know if you want to add any issues that they have to deal with. No, just I think it's the same problem that we see in the smaller towns and communities where there isn't enough work for the younger generation. So they're losing a lot of people to the cities and when they go to the cities they, they lose contact with their culture. I have a very learned question that um, I, I'm, I'm simply going to read because um, I don't understand any of it, but I, <laughs> I suspect you would. So, so the question from Catherine Kidd is, is there interaction between the First Nations of Canada and the native communities in Alaska? If yes, how is that expressed? You mentioned Edward Curtis. How has the understanding uh, of his work and its, its significance changed. So the whole swatch of land from Washington State, British Columbia into south, the, the, the southeast part of Canada is all the First Nations. Within that are different tribal groups. So really you don't separate them. They're all part of one entity that we call First Nations. So further north, there'll be the Tlingit, as you go down in Queen Charlotte Island, you have the Haida, then the Kwakutl, and then the, the, the Shim Sham further down. So these are diff like cousins, if you will. So they're all interacting and they're all related. But uh, geographically, they don't mix with the other indigenous tribes like the Inuit or the Eskimos that are living farther north. Um, there was some trade with, the, with some of the people on the plains on the other sides of the mountains, but basically they pretty much stay within that Northwest Coast region. As far as Edward Curtis goes, um, I don't know if you're aware, but his, his dream was to photograph all of the native peoples of the Northern Hemisphere okay. because there was a, a, a thought that they were all going to become extinct. So it was basically documenting an ex uh, uh, all these peoples before their cultures went away, and he would uh, have them dressed up and stage different, just you know, photographs so that he could get all of these paraphernalia into his photos and have them uh, pose for him. And he was a brilliant photographer, and he sold subscriptions for these books that he put out on all the different tribes. He he really didn't make any money doing it, but now they're considered very collectible and very valuable because he did document. Uh, a time that's no longer there. This is coming back to me. Uh, it, it, was he around the time of Teddy Roosevelt? Or yes. Uh, yes. So, yes. So actually, the two people that that helped sponsor this project, Teddy Roosevelt was number one. So you came back to you correctly, Bill. 
And right. the other one was J. Pierpont Morgan. Uh, uh, and those were his, his, his sponsors back in the early 1900s when they had started this project. Yeah. I, it was interesting, um, apropos of, of uh, I guess, of your talk, is I was reading a piece last night that was um, very critical of uh, the conservation efforts uh, in the early 20th century uh, of uh, 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 Teddy Roosevelt, who proudly on one hunting expedition killed 11,000 uh, 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 animals, uh, 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 Audubon, who it is maintained, uh, had uh, a slave assistant uh, as he was working. Um, and John Muir said unpleasant things about uh, Jews and, um, and Negroes in his private writings. Uh, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just curious if there is that same sort of um, edginess uh, as, as people uh, examine the culture and the interaction between uh, Native peoples and, and dominant white culture. Well, I, th I think that a lot of the tone was established by Boaz, and he approached these uh, cultures with a great deal of respect. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So I don't think it, he was demeaning them. I think he was documenting them so that we could see that other cultures existed that were just as complex as ours, and you would appreciate the variety of, of, of human nature. I I, I, I have a question, and uh, uh, I need to think about shifting gears myself, so um, I, I may turn the responsibility of, of uh, questions over to, to another, but um, uh, as collectors, um, I, I'd love to hear two stories from you. Uh, one would be um, your, your greatest triumph as collectors, that which gave you the greatest satisfaction and the flip side, the greatest failure, disappointment, if only we had fill in the blank. So I think our greatest triumph was related to the story Joe told you about the Chilcot blanket that was repatriated to the Avista Cultural Center. And two things, first off, we got it at auction and we knew, and sometimes you get a bargain at an auction, we knew that this was grossly undervalued, it was dirty, it hadn't been maintained properly. And we knew what we had. A matter of fact, this is the only time I think about it at Sotheby's. Yeah, and, and they called us and they to tell us that we had the successful bid, which we did by mail. And the first thing she said to me was, you stole this. Huh. So, so that was, on, but then the, it even, even gives us more satisfaction seeing it go home. Right. And seeing this be the centerpiece of one of the most important cultural institutions within this, this culture and seeing that the, the pride they have to, to, that it went back home. So, so that, that blanket, both our acquiring it and then our deassessing it, both sides of it is our greatest, uh, my, our greatest uh, pleasure. On the flip side, um, when we approach auctions, so we get buy pieces from dealers, from artists and from auction houses. And we approach auction, just, just happened to us uh, a week ago. This was an auction that occurred at Bonham Butterfield in, in San Francisco, and it was a beautiful amulet. We showed some of them. This was a spectacular amulet. The auction house had it appraised an estimated value of one to 2,000. I knew that was grossly under. I was, we were gonna, willing to pay five or six or maybe a little bit more. Um, I really wanted it, but we, when you go to auctions, one of the things we've learned is you gotta be disciplined. So we always set an upper limit and we will not go past it. It's a, it's a ceiling, we will not go past. That piece sold at auction last week for $20,000, estimated at one to two. I was disappointed we didn't get it, it was a spectacular piece, but you know what? We have other pieces, we can live with that disappointment. <laughs> uh, when it comes to um, authenticating uh, a piece, I was just thinking about this with the, um, uh, it was terrible. I was looking at the the metal with the with the cross and the bent metal and all the rest of it, and I was thinking, I, gee, I know somebody who's a metal worker. I bet he could bang out a couple of those. Um, do, do you 
do you rely on experts? To what extent do you rely on your own instincts and eyes? So both of those, yeah, we rely on experts, we rely on instincts, um, auction houses uh, will often, and it, that, that's why the provenance is so important. So if a piece has a significant provenance, then we know that it's been in a collection for X number of years or been in a museum, a number of pieces that were deassessed by museums. But you have to also use common sense in your own eye to, to look, evaluate these as well. But I think a, a good indicator is a significant provenance. And that's why auction houses love to have good provenance when they, they sell these pieces. And also you have to know the dealers. You know, we, we dealt with people who would, you know, we would call them and say, we're interested in this piece. And they'd say, no, it's, it's not really, you know, it's not really worthwhile. Or, you know, and, and there were other dealers who we knew only had really high end quality materials. <clears throat> and we would trust them to, to be, be truthful with us. Yes. But, but a very important part of collecting, and apropos to your question, Phil, is education. So we have not only collected, but we study this. We have in our research library some of the original texts from the early ninth, from the early 20th century, uh, and we have about 150 volumes just related to this art form, contemporary right. as well as old volumes. And so we, you know, it's a constant study, and we're all constantly learning. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, fascinating. I'm uh, I'm ready to go out and start collecting something. Uh, <laughs> I'm not well, sure. I'm not sure what it is, but uh, uh, you've given us all inspiration and seriously uh, just uh, shown us uh, a magical, spiritual, art artistic world that um, I'm sure all of us knew something about. Uh, but now we know a lot more about. And so thank you so much for that. You're you're very welcome, and and I tell you that's part of the fun of having a collection like this is sharing our enthusiasm with other people. That's and great. I just have to share one short story with you. Before we started collecting anything, I knew a gentleman who, who had a phenomenal art collection. And what he said was, someday you'll have enough money and you'll want to collect something. Find something you really like and study it and learn about it and just concentrate on one thing. And then in future years, you won't have a collection of one, one of a kind of everything. You'll have a real collection. Yeah. So we, we kept that in mind as we were studying and buying our pieces. Well, very good advice. Well, th uh, uh, thank you once again. Really was a wonderful presentation, oh, as, as all of these notes say. <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening.